Thank you. We can start. There's no greater agony. Sorry. There's no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. With this thought, good morning, and I welcome you all to the special webinar series organized by Indian Institute of Material Management, Jaipur, and Nirvan University, Jaipur. Nirvan University, to give you an overview, is the fastest growing university situated in pink city of Jaipur with multidisciplinary courses offered in umbrella of streams, ranging from engineering and technology to hospitality, yoga, agriculture, education, and also now a center for women and gender studies to name a few. The greatest impetus and the focus of the university is on research. And for this, we have started and initiated this webinar series to bring on a common platform, the prestigious and revered academicians and leaders around the globe. And in this series, we are honored to have Professor Suhas Joshi with us today of IIT Bombay. Now talking about Professor Joshi, and his uh, credentials is like showing a lamp to the sun for me. But <laughs> still, for the formality, I would like to introduce, sir, is Dean Alumni and Corporate Relations and, prof and also Rahul Bajaj Chair Professor in Mechanical Engineering Department of IIT Bombay. He has been head of the Department of Mechanical Engineering also of IIT Bombay, a postdoctoral researcher Adogia USA. He has undertaken more than 38 researches and consultancy and has been recipient of various awards like Boys Cast Fellowship of Government of India for Young Researcher, Best Faculty Award for Mechanical Engineering Department, IIT Bombay, and Dr. P.K. Patwardhan Technological Development Award of IIT Bombay. He has served as an editor of various prestigious journals. Currently, he's an associate editor of Machining Science and Technology, Journal of Taylor and Francis, and Indian Journal of Engineering and Material Sciences, CSIR and NISCAIR. So it's a privilege for us to have Professor Joshi with us to deliberate upon a very important topic of how to write a good research paper. To formally call him or invite him and welcome him. I'll, I'll, in, uh, I'll uh, request Professor Goel, Registrar and Pro-President of Nirvan University, who himself is a keen researcher and has numerous patents and awards under him. Recently, the Engineering Excellence Award, which have been conferred on him by Honorable Governor of Rajasthan. So I request Professor Goel to kindly welcome Professor Joshi. Thank you, Professor Tanda. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. Also, on behalf of IIM Jaipur and Nirvan University Jaipur, I heartily welcome you all in this webinar on very relevant topic of how to write a good research paper. I would like to welcome today's chief guest and keynote speaker, Professor Suhas Joshi from IIT Bombay. Sir, welcome. Thank you. I would like to welcome my colleagues of Nirvana University Jaipur, fellow colleagues from IIM, different colleagues from different IITs, moderator of this program, Professor Tandan, uh, and uh, connected through different social media platforms across the globe. IIM is having around 10,000 members with wide network of 52 branches and 19 chapters of professionals engaged in materials management, responsible for planning, sourcing, logistics, and supply chain management. And here at Nirvan University, Jaipur, this university was incorporated by Act Number no. 2 of 2017 of Government of Rajasthan, and it is promoted by Nirvan Charitable Trust. We are running various certificate, diploma, advanced diploma, UG, PG, and PhD programs, and this is located in the pink city of Jaipur. Once again, I heartily welcome you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Goel. Writing a perfect research paper is like a military action, they say. You need a lot of discipline, foresight, research strategy, and a whole lot of experience. So 
Now I give the mic and the platform to Professor Joshi to deliberate and share his insight and experience on the topic. Sir, please. Unmute yourself, sir. Yes. yes. Am I audible? Am I audible? It's okay. There's some problem. Uh, most probably you are logging with two different devices which are closely placed. Sir, please unmute. So is it okay now? Now this is fine. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. perfect. Sir. Okay. Okay. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, uh, Tandon, uh, who approached me all uh, uh, out of blue, I think. <laughs> and um, okay, I thought I will give a shot and uh, talk to her and see what can be done. Mm, and also thanks to Professor Goel for inviting me. So uh, this is some topic which I keep uh, talking to the students and I keep talking to the faculty members of various uh, engineering colleges, especially when they come to IIT Bombay. So I'll share my screen and then uh, let's see how it goes. Present my, share my presentation. So, am I, uh, is presentation visible? Yes, sir. No. So, while it's a important uh, topic for all the researchers that how to write a good journal paper uh, we often find that there are a lot of rejections which happen to our papers, which happen to me also. There are many, many rejections which have happened to me, and even now also they happen. Uh, so there is nothing to worry about it. Uh, it's a it's an ongoing and continuous kind of a learning process. Anybody's paper can get rejected because uh, you are writing with certain thought process and. Uh, reviewers are thinking it from the different thought processes. So very rarely that uh, these thought processes would match, but we should not uh, stop attempting to catch that particular skill and you know try to uh, acquire the skill of writing a good paper. So it is it's always essential that you keep on learning and I'm tell you I will tell you that this will never end. Nobody's paper ever has got accepted in the first attempt as it is. So, uh, but we try to make uh, the minimum possible attempt and as we go ahead. So some of the steps which I am trying to put forward are, for writing a good paper, you should have a good knowledge of literature. You should define a good goal of your work you should have good objectives, novel objectives. You should think about the methods which you will use while you are performing the, while you are performing the, you know, the research. You might use some kind of design of experiments or analytical or mathematical models. You should prepare a good account of those findings. And then either it, it is in the form of a paper or it is in the form of a thesis. I just want to clarify here is that 
if you want to write a thesis, the audience is completely different. If you write a paper, the audience is completely different. If you write an interim report of your work for the uh, for the uh, institute, your audience is completely different. So, so you have to all those things have a different different connotations and different uh, systems to be followed. I won't go into details of that, but I'll give you glimpses of at least writing a good paper, which I feel that you will be able to use that. Uh, for writing a good thesis also. Uh, coming to literature review, for writing a good paper, you have to have a good literature review. So you should do a thorough search of the literature. One of the important aspects of the literature is that uh, there is a huge amount of literature, which is, we always face with this problem that there are a large number of papers and how do I read and how do I find out what is the uh, what is the new out of it and get over it. So while doing a literature review, you have to do a kind of uh, very objectively, you should work with very objectively. What does it mean objectively? Saying that you have to continuously see the papers which you are getting. So it is not necessary that whatever papers you have obtained through search engines, various search engines are available. And uh, uh, it's not necessary that you understand those at the first instance. But it's very important that you are able to classify that particular publication or a paper which you have collected as uh, very important to you or okay little bit important or something like you know no i will see it little later but this decision should not be taken by reading the complete paper because a paper in a good international journal is a work of one year or two of a group of authors and if you say that I will read this in five minutes and I should understand everything quickly, uh, no, it is not possible. Nobody will understand that. But to be able to get a judgment that whether this work will be relevant to us or not relevant to me, that is something we should be able to do at the first instance. So while you are reading, it's better to read the title and better to read the abstract first. Now, you will wonder what is there in title, what is there in abstract. At the end, you will come to know how important it is to write a proper title and give a correct information about what the paper contains. What I tell my students is that you first go to the go to the library go to the search engines and get the titles of the papers in, on that particular theme you simply read the titles and by reading the i listening to those titles i can make out who is working this paper is coming from which group in the world and who could be a probable author or which country paper could be coming. Because I know that in my field at least, and that way everybody is expert in his or her field, that uh, this kind of work is done by this university professor in this particular country. So just by reading the title, student will revise, recite the titles and I can tell that, okay, this is important, it's probably from this country, this is from important, this is probably from this country. So you should look into these papers. So what I mean is that the titles are so important and so informative that they not only tell you the work which is being done, but they tell you from where it is originated, which group and which country it is originating. Even that has that much ability to indicate. So, 
So then we select certain papers based on the title. And then I said, now you choose some of these papers and read the abstract. Now, reading the abstract is another important art and reading further the paper. So now what happens is that the abstract has a certain, certain content. It has about four to five sentences. And these four to five sentences are very, very important. They are the key sentences. Now you'll wonder, what are those sentences? Probably the first sentence is in the abstract is need of the problem. What is the need of the problem? Maybe the sentences would come in a, in a different sequence. It doesn't matter. But one is why you are doing this work. It's in one sentence you have to write. The second sentence is status in literature. Status in literature, in the sense that where my work stands vis-a-vis -vis the entire literature. So I can say that while the experimental methodologies in the literature has explored some X, Y, Z things, but some V and W have not been, or ABC have not been explored. Therefore, the objective of the work, it comes, you boil down to the novel objective. So basically, these two sentences, or maybe a single sentence, which will hit upon the novelty of the work, that what I am doing new. So you have to do something new, something different from the existing literature. So this will be the case. Then there will be a sentence on methodology. We are following experimental methodology. You are doing mathematical modeling. We are doing simulations. We are doing survey and uh, you know statistical analysis of the things, whatever, methodology. There will be one sentence on methodology. Then there will be another sentence on main results. You may have several results, but one of the most important result, we find that, we found that X is Y and X and Y are important or whatever, whatever, but your key result should come there. Maybe you can take a liberty of adding two and three sentences together and then adding second main result. Second important result. No, that's it. Now, these sentences are sort of jumbled in the abstract. Whenever you take an abstract, I'll give you at the end example how to read the abstract. But these sentences are jumbled in it. Now, as a no highs, you will find it initially difficult. But slowly, once you, once you train yourself, you'll come to know that, oh, here, this particular sentence is talking about, he or she is talking about the methodology. This sentence is about the key result. And this sentence is about novelty. Many times you will find that some of the papers will have novelty, newness of the work explicitly mentioned in the abstract itself. So when you read the abstract, you will get a lot of ideas. If you read these abstracts properly, you'll get a lot of ideas. In the sense that they will write in one sentence, what's the status of literature? How this my work is different from somebody else's earlier work? And so on and so forth. So the abstract reading becomes very important in the literature review. Now, based on this reading of abstract, you probably will be able to say that whether this paper is good for me or not. So, uh, so this is where you can classify your papers. So when I, I say classify your papers, you say that most relevant, then you classify is that little relevant, 
and you classify it as maybe later. I am not going to read now. I will see see later. Now, once you find, then you first instance you go through the abstracts of the papers. I'll give you a little more about the uh, the construction of a paper so that you will you will know where to read the in a in a short while. So, if you give me a paper, I will in five minutes, I will be able to scan through it. I may not understand all things, but I will, I should know where I should look for, for a certain most important things which are there in the paper. Say, for example, I have read the abstract. I got to know that these people are doing something new. Now, what happens is, if you go to the introduction of a paper, This is a slightly extended, what we can say, extended view of the abstract. In the sense that, again, there is a need of problem, which is probably two sentences here. Earlier it was one sentence, very short sentence. Here it could be two sentences, or sometimes it's a paragraph or something. Then literature review, past literature. This is probably the most important section of the introduction that some scientists have done this, somebody has done this, somebody has done this, one one sentence on each of these and references we add. So this is about one to one and a half page. And then comes out is conclusions on literature review conclusions on literature review so there will be one key conclusion which will lead to the novelty and this sentence of novelty is situated at the end of the introduction therefore there will be something something like a new class therefore we propose to do something X, Y, Z. So what I suggest, what I feel is that you don't have to go too much into the details, but after reading the abstract, you know that somebody is doing something new. You hit upon at the end of the uh, introduction where he or she will position it himself or herself vis-a-vis -vis the entire literature. So your research is always vis-a-vis -vis the entire, uh, entire literature. So there you position where this particular class is and see how well this uh, novelty is actually defined. Then there is methodology section in the paper. And then there is a, a results and discussion. And there is something like conclusions. So now when you know that somebody is saying that I have developed something new, you before in the results and in the methodology section, it will tell you how it has arrived at, how it has been done, how it has been done. Then in the results and discussion section, we will, we will check there will be some results earlier, but one or two important results will be there. And those will address the novelty which is there at the beginning. So you take the thread from the beginning, from the abstract, and you see at the end of the introduction, then you see how it is done in the experiments uh, methodology, and then go to the results, leave all the results and come to the main result. And then you go to the conclusion section where the, there is a concluding a remark on this or the final result of that. So by, by scanning through the paper, you will be able to get a certain idea that yes, these people are doing certain things. This person, a group of researchers is doing certain things. Now, sometimes you write down these aspects in your own words. And we say that, you know, the research slip you make for paper or something like that. But today's date, you know, you have, you have a Excel sheets. You, know, you can make a paper 
you can make one section on methodology. They are using some XYZ technology, statistical methods or something. In the results, you can say that these are the important research. Something like that per paper, you can make a row on novelty, which is, which is prescribed by, suggested by the, uh, uh, I mean, claimed by the uh, researcher, how it is achieved, certain methods, certain steps, certain mathematical models are mentioned in the methodology. You better capture those and their final conclusion. I think this might, should not take more than 20, 25 minutes for you to go through one, one particular paper, provided you have read the abstracts and uh, classified them as most relevant papers. So this I'm talking about reading more details about the most relevant papers, okay? Little relevant, you just keep this aside. Maybe later you just keep third, third section later on. Because what will happen is that some of these papers will refer to your little relevant papers. Sometimes they will refer to your maybe later papers. Those references will come. But if you don't get sufficient references here, sufficient paper or sufficient information, then you go to the next stage and something like that. So it's important to classify, read the abstracts, classify the papers, then those who are saying the most relevant, you go through those papers, not in detail, and then come back, to, uh, 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 come back to the next paper, come back to the next paper, keep on adding this into your Excel sheet. You will find that you have, you have simply developed a new kind of Excel sheet where all the new methodologies or new results you are compiled together and you know, if they are doing experiments, you, you can find out what levels of experiments they are used, what kind of methods they are used, what kind of machines they are used. And then if you now take vertical columns, you have divided that whole literature into various kind of sections, which will help you to prepare the report on this literature review, which says that these are the methods people have used, these are the uh, techniques they have used. These are the conclusions they are drawing. So by way of reading and you know, putting the information into the Excel sheet, you have already classified or saved the literature and you have got one Excel sheet, which is an overview of the entire work which others have done. Now you know that people have done like this, like this, like this. Now, how do I do a, a, a novel work. So that is where now you have to discuss with your professors and see what new I can do, what I can add delta you can add into the existing research. Of course, you have to ensure that you have papers from the recent papers, you have past papers or something like that. Generally, uh, you can't say how many papers uh, will be required for a good publication, but uh, most relevant publications, there should be about uh, 15 probably. If you say the most relevant are 15, the little relevant will be about 1.5 times of that and uh, maybe later will be around. around. So if you, if you make about two times or three times the publications you are reviewed, then you probably get one third of them could be your most relevant and Two third could be either in the little relevant or maybe later part, you know, something like that. So, in order to get the one third, you have to, you know, you have to do two third plus one third. I mean, you have to do one, then out of which I think the one third probably could be relevant paper. So, it, generally, that's the that's the way you measure your two. So, make a good report of your findings. Make this Excel sheet as as valuable as possible and make a good report of your findings before you decide to do what you want to do. Or, uh, you know, basically a good research is based on a good review of literature, good problem statement or something like that. So the next stage comes once you are done with it, uh, defining a research problem. So again, why you are doing it. Sometimes it so happens that somebody else, like industry persons give you a problem, but, uh, when the industry person gives you a problem, then it might, you might say that uh, uh, you might have to check whether people have done this kind of work earlier or not. Again, so you have to again go back to the literature and find out 
whether people have done this kind of work, what is the status. If there is a solution exists, you just say that, no, this is not the research problem or my research problem could be different from, I will give you a solution, I will develop a technology and give you, but my research problem will be a bit different because this work has already been done. So the research problem will be the outcome of my uh, literature review, which I'm doing. So again, here you, uh, you have to know what is the necessity. You have to know the present status and what you propose to do in your work. Now, when you want to do a research, there are, you face with certain what is good and what is bad. So we always face what is, what I should do, which will help me to publish a paper. So if you make a good report, probably it will tell you where to go. People are developing devices or people are finding out some fundamentals, uh, fundamental research, or they are writing patents on that, or what kind of research. So basically it comes out, boils down to a fundamental research or application research. So if you want a good publication, then there has to be some fundamental research involved, some basic phenomena which you will involve, which you will investigate, physics of the problem you will try to investigate, saying that I want to go deeper into understanding these. As I said, that some people would like to go deeper and try to find out, investigate effect of a certain parameters which have not been so far uh, studied by others or something like that. You know, you can say that I want to do fundamental this. A certain phenomena you want to investigate. You know that results are something like this and why these results are happening like this. Applied research is that something like where you develop something and after that you say that you are, uh, uh, you are developing a device and testing those devices and then you are, uh, you know, putting forward the device development. That also can be a, a research publication, the testing, designing a device, making it and testing it and understanding its characteristics, that also can be one of the. So basically you face the dilemma, good science content, good fundamental research content will give you, uh, uh, so in our domain, we say that whether science or engineering, you are more applied oriented or you are more, more research oriented or science oriented what physical phenomena, what physics you are trying to investigate. And are you applying this physics into a certain device and you are making a device? That's the engineering part. So similarly, fundamental research and application research. Everywhere it will come like you are developing something device, then it becomes a sort of a, uh, uh, application. So this is where you have to define a problem that whether you, you do uh, fundamental research or you do application. So generally for a MTech and PhD students, we say that you keep both things in hand. You do fundamental aspects into your hand and start investigating. And you also should have at the end some kind of application of that into the real life, making a product, making a system, making a device, making a machine or whatever, you know, something like that. So you go both things hand in hand and over a period of time, you will realize that the student is very proficient in fundamental research. Some students are very proficient in application oriented research. So, you know, depending on the proficiency of the students and faculty and professors involved, sometimes it is 70% of the fundamental research and 30% of application, or it could be 80, 20, something like this, or it could be 80% application and 20% uh, fundamental or theoretical thing. But a good research should contain both. It should contain a fundamental research as well as the application. It should be some format, 80, 20 maximum on either side, but it should be there. Both parts must be there in a good research. So you'll find that uh, if you make only theory and submit a paper, they'll say that, hey, where is the experimental validation? Where is the uh, application of this? So again, the thing will come back. If you do only the, uh, uh, if you only the, uh, do the experimental work, they say that, oh, tell us that uh, it is experimentally valid. 
if you are not able to do experiments at least use somebody's experiments and show that your results are matching or your results are giving logical results uh, they are logical we say this the experimental uh, 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 work by somebody else if not if you are not able to do your ends but that balance has has to be maintained uh, in in all the cases so that's how you define the research problem so when you start you start with both things in hand with open mind depending on the student's abilities facilities you will turn either this side or this side but some balance has to be maintained at the end in a final thesis uh coining a research objective is very important that what i want to do so you divide the problem into smaller statements i want i want to investigate a phenomena of a spark formation say for example i have a an anode and a cathode and i bring the anode and cathode between uh, very close to each other when uh, and we have a dielectric medium between the two and when you bring this very close to each other then at a certain point of time you applied you apply a voltage across the two you will find that the dielectric medium gets ionized and the electrons start flowing from uh, the uh, cathode to anode and a plasma is formed basically a plasma is formed between the two uh, polarities even though there is a dielectric medium non conductive medium between the two then the plasma is formed and that plasma involves the flow of electrons the electrons flow at very high speed and they bombard on the anode and the ions go positive ions go to the cathode and they also they are heavier so they bombard slowly on the other side so because of this spark formation one cavity is created on cathode and other cavity is created on anode because of this spark formation so so now i want to investigate the phenomena that how much energy is transferred between the two what is the difference in shapes and sizes of the cavities which are formed on both the sides of anode and cathode is a very fundamental investigation of spark erosion process we call this as a spark erosion process it erodes on anode it erodes on cathode also okay so so now break this into a smaller problems first i want to understand what is the energy transition between the two how much energy of the plasma goes to anode and how much goes to cathode and how much goes to the surrounding so break the problems into smaller steps and each statement should be complete so you should have a three or four objectives each statement should be complete and uh, uh, in the sense that uh, it should provide link to the next this should not be disjointed statements objective should be one two or three and they are connected or they are progressively going from one stage to another now coming to methodology what do you want to decide now you have decided that i will investigate a certain phenomena but whether you will investigate experimentally whether you investigate statistically by collecting the information or you will investigate it by analytically you will try to make a model out of it so there are variety of ways by which you can methodologies by which you can attack a attack a problem now many times there are difficulties in experiments many times there are difficulties in simulations many times say for example uh, aerospace domain you uh, you cannot afford to do, do even forget about experiments but you cannot afford to do even simulations the simulations of aircraft flying under various circumstances and all systems moving are like massive massive simulations they are like they require enormous computational power enormous manpower enormous brain power and they are not so easily possible so even sometimes experiments forget about experiments you cannot even do simulations in in some cases so so when you begin your research you better keep hand on all two or three aspects experiments mathematical models and simulations and 
as you go ahead you realize that certain things are possible and certain things are not possible of course your supervisor is involved in such cases and then towards the end of your masters this is probably you will come to know that oh i have done 70% of experiments and 30% of the analytical model something like that so all the methodologies you should keep open many times your experimental device breaks down in the way and uh, i have seen uh, students say that oh mera experiment band ho gaya because device is not working so it's better to keep theoretical aspect also with you because as i said in the beginning that your experiments are to be supported by theory and theory is to be supported by experiment both things are required so a good exp- good work should have a good content if it is 50 50 that's the best but if it is not 60 40 70 80 70 30 or 80 20 either of the side if you are 80% experimental work then 20% of theoretical work at least is required in in a good good paper so you weigh when you want to do a good pay, good work research work you have to weigh ki main survey karu ya main experiments karu ya main uh, theoretical model banau or i do a simulation on the computer so that is where this uh, this weighing has to be done but we have to ensure that at least uh, both are balanced and in a good good paper or a good work so once you define the objectives you define the methodologies is better to use some kind of methods design of experimental methods to design your experiments say for example uh, there are methods of design statistical methods of designing experiments which will help you to uh, perform less number of experiments and get the maximum uh, knowledge out of out of these also designing experiments is not sufficient it's a massive field of designing experiments i won't want to go in details of that Uh, but once you design for that you require what are the dependent variables what are dependent variables what kind of design you want to choose and so on and so forth then you perform the experiments when you perform the experiments you have it is it is possible that you perform one experiments and you take a gap of you know 10 days and you perform another one and then you perform another one something like this then you will find that there is a lot of Uh, what we call it as the lot of devils will come into into picture which are called as the noise factors so for example during day time it is very hot and during night time it is very cold so sometimes you do experiments in the day time and other experiments you do in the night time i'm sure your environmental humidity is going to play a massive role into it so there are variables which you cannot take as a part of your dependent or independent variables are called as noise variables and these noise variables are very important because now when you do experiments in the night in rajasthan probably that you have a huge humidity and your results are different when you do in a hot day time your results are different you will feel that oh this difference in the results is because of the uh, because of my experimental parameters but that is not so it is because of the devils that is the noise which is actually coming into picture because you are done half experiments here and half experiments here i will give you one small example of how the devils come into this exam uh, into the experiments and um, Uh, uh, and you feel that oh these are the experimental results uh, i had one mtech student who had to do 27 experiments and uh, he he performed 18 experiments and the machine stopped working now nine experiments were to be done so we were trying to get the machine up and then we realized that no way the machine can be up by the time he finishes 
After a few days, he came to me and said that, sir, we have another laboratory, which is just adjacent to our laboratory. They also have bought the same machine at the same time when one machine was installed here, four machines were installed there. In the, this is just other side of the wall, the other laboratory. Sir, it is the same time all machines were bought. One was installed here and three were installed there. So I will now do all the experiments there, rest of the experiments there. I said, well, I mean, there is no way you can do so. Let's go, you go and do it. So he went and performed the experiment. And to our surprise, sorry. Okay, something happened, I think. Mm. Okay, share has stopped working. Yes, it's there. Ah, okay, one minute. Okay, so, so he were performed the experiments on the other side of the machine, but at the same time, same machine, same manufacturer, everything same. Only thing is that these machines were on the other side of the wall and this machine was in our laboratory. Now, when the results come, these results, 20, 18 experimental results are here and nine experimental results are here. Completely different. Now, same manufacturer, same machines kept there and kept here. Results are completely different. Then what did, what's the problem? The problem is that those machines were not at all used and this machine was heavily used for last 10 years or 15 years after installation. Their characteristics are different. Their performance characteristics are completely different and uh, they will give you completely different results. So now if I say that this is because my parameters are different. This effect is because of my parameters which are different. Then I am a, I am making a wrong statement. So many times these devils or noise variables play a major role in your experiments. They may not they may not create this kind of a difference. You know, it's very apparent difference, but they create a difference which you feel that oh, it's my result. But it is not your result, but it is actually a result of noise variable. The wrong way you have done the experiments or you have not chosen the right atmosphere. So it is good to do all the experiments in a single setup. So students, what they do is that 20 experiments are there. Okay, I will do 10 now. And I'm telling you that you will have some devils getting into it when he or she comes back. And you will say that, oh, these are my results. But no, these are actually devils which are playing and these are not your results. Now, that is where the performing experiments is, is a very important in a consistent manner at the same time at the same location, in the same environmental conditions. In Mumbai, it is, if you do rainy season, it's like moisture, huge moisture. And if you do it in a summer, it's like a very dry. So you are going to get the result. So understanding, apart from understanding your main variables, it is important to understand what kind of noise variables are there. And these noise variables, how much they are coming in. So many times we have to draw design the experiments uh, if you are, if there are many noises then you know you have to design the experiment for one noise variable say for example this experiment in rainy season gives you this result and this experiment in winter season gives me this kind of result and then try to uh, try to find out the difference between the two and say that oh this is because of the devil and not because of the experimental parameter so uh, uh, and that is where the performing experiments at certain instances is very important, at the same instances is very important. So, uh, choosing the right design, choosing the right design 
performing the experiments, obtaining the results from the experiments. Many times we obtain the results and we say that, oh, there's no train nahi hai. Increasing nahi hai, decreasing nahi hai, nothing is there. And nahi kuch nahi ho gaya, experiments kuch nahi mila. So that's a typical problem. And uh, I also faced that. I kept my results closed for one year during my PhD. So there are no trends. But the point is that you have to make a friendship with the results. You have to make the friendship with what these results is talking. And then you will say that, oh, this data point is going here away because of a certain reason, because of certain things. So you develop, you mull over the results. You go over the results. You think why it is happening like this. The moment you start talking to the uh, talking to the results, you will find that the results will ta start talking to you. After one year, I when I opened the file, I found that oh, everything is talking to me, and I just uh, I just kept this file kept these results uh, into a file uh, for no reason. But that's always like you know you you go you go to a college and you know, first day you find that, oh, some boy or some girl is very rude here. He's, uh, he's like uh, not able, not, uh, I mean, he, cannot, he or she cannot be a good friend. But you start talking, you start interacting. And after some time, you find out, oh, my earlier, earlier uh, assumption was wrong. Oh, no, I, now we are good friends. So it is like that. The experimental data has to be analyzed. It has to be plotted in different, different ways, different forms, different ways. And you make a friendship with it. And then the results, are, the data starts talking to you. And once it starts talking to you, you'll realize, oh, why this is happening? Why this is happening? Okay, okay. So now all things will fall in place. And that's where the obtaining results from experiments and presenting them is another key of a good publication. So just to summarize now, uh, preparing a good finding. So you have done a good literature review. You have done a good, uh, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, methodology for selected. You have chosen a right problem with science and fundamentals and, uh, you know, the application. Then you have worked on defined methodologies, which are either experimental, mathematical, or whatever. And then you have carried out experiments with a, you know, certain methodical way. And then you are now ready with the whole thing. So again, going back to this, that it's like a, uh, it's like a flashback in a movie, you know? So um, uh, you will come to know the story, the certain stories after you go back and all that. So it is like this. Now you come back here, as I, I told most of the stories here that what is a good publication? Because they, because now how to write a good paper requires all those things. And now you come back to the reality, you will find that introduction to be written. So the first paragraph is, or first two sentences is the need of the problem, need of the topic, why this topic is important that you should write first. Then the present status of the literature. So that I think in the, now you know that in the abstract, it comes out as a one sentence, but here it comes out about, about one to one and a half pages. So this is one or two sentences. Okay, then a paragraph comes in the introduction of a paper, which is which talks about conclusions from the literature, review, which is critical conclusion, which lead to the novelty or the objective of your problem. So this goes to this, it leads to the novelty or object. You know now that if a reader is going to read the paper, he or she is going to go at the end of literature review in the introduction and hit upon that particular statement where you are writing. Therefore, this paper presents XXX, XYZ, a fundamental understanding of spark formation in the, you know, when the two anodes and cathodes come together, something like that. So, so now you should put it like that in your publication so that it facilitates. A paper, a good paper is always like, you know, you start from the title and from title, there is a thread and through which you actually take the reader 
you take him by hand and then so you actually flow him i mean take him through all the sections of the paper till the uh, uh, till the conclusion so it's like a storyline you know a movie has a some kind of a storyline so every paper has a storyline you are the story here is that you are you are establishing a dialogue with the world community when you write a paper you are establishing a dialogue with the world community you are telling them that this is my story this is what is my new thing which i am doing this is how i am going and this is what is my conclusion so then the reviewer will read that and say that oh no i don't understand your story here i don't understand how did you assume here i don't understand how did you do this i don't understand so then they will say that you revise your paper okay so now i get ideas and i revise my paper and then again i submit to the reviewers the reviewers again read that they are read the answers of the questions they see the corrections which you have made and they said okay now now this story is complete and those gaps are filled so writing a paper is establishing a dialogue with the international community every paper has to say something and how explicitly how vividly you say so you explain those things is up to you it is an art and it has to be acquired once you acquire this art of uh, uh, writing a good paper it is useful in all the fields whether you are in the industry whether you are in the uh, marketing whether you are in the uh, uh, research every anywhere you you go anywhere if you are able to study a literature and understand and make a finding and decide a new goal you are by acquiring this skill you by because of acquiring this skill you are just one or one percent of the people attending any interviews i can tell you that by virtue of acquiring this ability you will automatically be one percent in the first one percent of that interview wherever you go it could be any 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 job it need not be a research job it can be a product development job it can be a marketing job it, you you have to have that ability to read summarize assimilate absorb and do new things it's all this is the basic ability which is required and if you have that you are just among the top you, you will be the top person in that so now coming back to here that this whole introduction is about one and a half say two pages or i'm just saying i just tell these uh, broad things to my students say that one one and a half page to upar nahi chahiye whatever and then come to what kind of a theme of a problem how are you going to attack a problem how are, how are you going to solve the problem i want to investigate how much percentage of the total plasma energy is going to anode or cathode so how are you going to do so you should write theme of the research in your problem or approach to the problem how am i going to approach to the problem i am going to calculate some x i am going to calculate y i am going to calculate z something is coming from experiment something is coming from theory you know i just take a block diagram and explain the theme of my work and then i come to the actual methodology methodology means how i am going to do i am going to do some xyz things in the approach and the next one i say that i am going to do a methodology i am going to this will be a 80% experimental work 20% theoretically i calculate certain things from simulation i calculate certain things so i give the details of simulation i give the experiment details of experiments i give the details of my survey or statistical analysis so this is called the next topic of the methodology and then results now you will wonder after doing so much uh you will find the research papers which have which have initial results which are common and you sometimes you say are these results are known to me yes these results are known they are there because the researcher want to show that when you use my experiments when i do experiments i get the results which are common which is nothing but benchmarking of my research which is confirming that my experiments are correct i know that if x increases y should increase and from my experimental results i am getting x increases and y uh, 
increases, then I am confirming that my experiments are up to the standard of previously published literature or in the textbook somewhere it is written so that they are correct. My experiments are correct. Suppose your results are coming other way around, then which means that there is a fundamentally there is something wrong. So I would not, I would present my basic results, which will help me to benchmark my uh, work saying that my work is appropriate. My experiments are not wrong. So, so one of the things in the research is that if someone wants to reproduce your results, he or she should be able to reproduce. One point of time, if you remember some 20 years ago, one Korean scientist had developed uh, some, I'm forgetting the exactly the results, some genome sequencing results of something. And he published it in a you know, biggest possible you know, the, uh, journal. The moment you publish, people will take that data and try to reproduce and see whether these results are coming correctly or not. After five or six months, the other scientists from other countries contested, saying that your results are not correct. We are not able to get your results based on what you have told us. After a lot of debate, the scientist from this country, I don't remember Korea most probably, he agreed that he has, he has not done the experiments correctly. He has agreed that he has not done the experiments correctly. So it's very important that you benchmark your results with some basic results, saying that there are four results there. So I show that my results are correct. They follow the basic fundamental principles. So I put forward the four results. Unfortunately, when you are reading the paper, you only read those four results and say that, oh, this is everything is known. This paper is only telling me everything is known. Then you make a mistake there because you don't know how to read a paper. Because initially, there will be benchmarking results, which are a little bit common, little bit similar to the earlier. And they mention it, saying that these results are similar to the earlier researchers, which means that my work is correct. There is no harm in saying that my results are same. Some of my results are same as that of somebody else's because somebody else's results in the literature have been reviewed by similarly by some other scientists. And when you say that my results are similar to that, then the people will believe that, oh, okay, okay. So you are similar to that result. So that means you are, you are, your experiments must be all right. Okay. So you take the advantage of that. So many times we say that, oh, we don't have good results. Good results will come later. First, take basic results and say that you are able to establish, benchmark your research. Then there will be some new results, which are key results, which you, have, you are proposing to investigate, which are your own results. And now that's where the key results and reasoning will come into picture. Why these results are like this? So you should present many times, uh, researchers present only the uh, results. And they don't say why. If you don't say why, then the results have no value. So you have to say why. And then you have to say that, therefore, what we uh, did a conjecture at the beginning is actually proved, or it is disproved, or it is acceptable, or demonstrated, or something like this. OK. So, so this is the results and discussion. It's again a dialogue. and you come to the conclusions where you highlight your achievement, putting them in a sequence that even though there are some trivial things at the beginning, you better to mention there are trivial things which benchmarking for purposes or a small results, put them together, put them in sequentially, and also address at least something that this work may lead to certain finding solutions to something, or whatever, you know, if you are able to conject, uh, provide a future conjecture, you can do this. So once you have written all these things, I would say that you go back 
go and write the abstract. Now you are in the right position to write the abstract of the abstract of the paper. Saying that, now I have to write based on the conclusions, based on the introduction, I have to write four or five sentences. Now you know which sentences are to be taken. Need of the problem, I had written one paragraph. I should combine that into one sentence. The second sentence comes at the base of the introduction where I'm talking about the novelty conclusions from literature review and that second sentence. The third sentence comes from your conclusions that are a methodology, it comes from a methodology. Then uh, then couple of results and main results one or two. So you should probably write the abstract at the end. And then you come to the title of the paper. I will tell you, if my student do 10 revisions for writing a paper, 10, 20, sometimes this can be 15 revisions in writing a paper, there will be at least 20 revisions in writing the abstract. And similarly, another 20 for writing, uh, writing the title of the paper. So now you can see that the title of the paper comes at the end because now you have got the complete view of what you are trying to present and how you want, what you want to tell what story you want to tell and those threads should be there in the title. So now you can see that from the title itself, title is linked to the abstract, abstract is linked to the introduction, introduction is linked to the methodology, theme of the work, then the results and discussion and then it comes to conclusions. You know, there is a close knit work and close knit story which is, uh, which is, which is to be presented. So I'll just give you uh, uh, some example of abstract reading and then maybe two, two examples are there and we'll stop here. So this is a abstract of one paper which I have taken from engineering, my field only. But I can tell you that once you practice this, you can read any abstract now after this. So let us read this. An experimental investigation was conducted to determine the effect of tool cutting edge geometry and workpiece hardness on the surface roughness and cutting forces in finished hard turning of so AISI 52100 steel. So this statement refers to methodology. So the first statement refers to methodology, right? Second statement, cubic boron nitride inserts of various cutting edge preparations uh, and th uh, uh, through hardened uh, steel bars were used as the cutting tool and workpiece material respectively. So you are using some tools and some workpiece and this is again talking about the methodology. As I said, you can write the format in which I have said, but you can, that's the indi indi individual style, how to write and how to write, but those statements are there somewhere in the abstract. Okay, now, this study shows that, okay, from here onwards, this study shows that, which means a result, a key result which is coming out. The effect of tool geometry and surface roughness is statistically significant. This is the first result. That's some XYJ is statistically Specifically, a large age hone radius result in the average surface roughness values than whatever, 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 due to increase in the flowing and shearing. So the author is telling you the result, but of physics behind it, a scientific reason behind it due to increase in the extent of flowing and shearing. Forget about what is flowing and shearing, but you understand that a result is put up, but there is a scientific, along with the scientific reasoning which is there. And that is what is the key. Simply result has no value. It is like a statement, but there is a, has to be a scientific reasoning behind it, which actually weighs, increases the weight of the result, which tells you that you are investigating a certain science in that particular paper. So when I read this result, oh, I will have to see what is that flowing and shearing they are talking about. That is the science which they are talking about, okay? That's the science which they are. The result has to be along with the explanation. The effect of two-factor interactions, et cetera, et cetera, is also found to be significantly important. This probably is the second important result. Additionally, a large cutting edge radius, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, 
one more result. So they have resorted to three sentences for the result. Uh, it, is, it is also shown that effect of workpiece hardness and axial components, etc., is significant, particularly for large aged tools. So there is some novelty which is probably coming in the in the last sentences and three, four and five sentences are the results. The first result is the most important, second is little less and the third is little less and the sixth one is probably a novelty. So what I mean is that you can change the sequences, you can put it in the same sequence which I was mentioning, uh, but it is up to the individual's uh, way of writing and way of thinking. So, uh, so this is one abstract. Maybe I'll give you one more example and then we will, will stop here. So now here you see that we examine segmented chip formation and associated flow dynamics in cutting of metals of low moderate workability using high speed imaging. Now, compared to the previous abstract, you find that this is little tough to read. You go further, you will find that it is much tougher because this journal gives you a restriction on the number of words in the abstract. It says that not more than 50 words or not more than 75 or 100 words. And you cannot, you cannot go more than that. So now you have to write, rewrite, write, rewrite, and you know, refine those concepts. So Anyway, the first sentence refers to the methodology. We examine segmented chip formation, et cetera, et cetera, associated flow dynamics in cutting of metals of low moderate workability. What kind of material they have investigated? They are cutting certain material and they are uh, using high speed imaging. So another method they are using, high speed imaging is the method. So this all is the methodology. So, Segmentation is initiated by surface instability formation of ductile crack in a probe on workpiece surface side of the tool. This crack then propagates towards the tool tip. Uh, you are finding it's little, little, little difficult, which says that segmentation is initiated by surface instability. It doesn't say that we find that. We find that is silent. Okay. He says that the segmentation is initiated by surface instability. Uh, uh, formation of a ductile crack in probe. In a position, at certain position, a crack is formed and that, that position is ahead of the tool. This crack then propagates towards the tool tip. So some, some crack is formed and it is propagating somewhere. So it is talking about the physics of the process. So, but it is the second sentence is the key result of the work. They have found that this is what it is. So they, since there is a limitation on the number of words, they have not said that we find that something like this, they are not mentioned. That. The third sentence is, pro CAC initiation occurs at a critical strain of 0.75, which is independent of material and deformation geometry. So probably there is something which is, they have found the result, which is sort of applicable universally. At a certain strain of 0.75, uh, a crack is formed and that crack is formed in all the materials. They see that in all the materials. So which means that your result is applicable to many materials. So which is a, I have, that is why third sentence I have put in the novelty that this is the key part of their work. This ductile failure is analyzed in terms of local hydrostatic stress and something like that, tri-stress triaxility is analyzed, which means that the fourth sentence is kind of methodology. It is talking about methodology. And a material agnostic, material independent method to suppress and enhance segmentation, constraint cutting, and has been demonstrated. So five. So there is something which has been, key thing which has been shown or demonstrated which is again in the novelty of the work. So you, you can now see the two abstracts. The first one was very easy to read and understand. The second one is pretty complex. You can see that this is an artwork of like an artwork. You know, you, somebody has sat together and word, word, wordsmithing. It is like wordsmithing. 
when they say that it should be a 50 words abstract oh my god then it becomes like huge hugely challenging at some of our uh, some of places when we send our resume for certain fellowships or something they say that write your entire work in 50 words entire work of 20 years in 50 words you can now imagine how many iterations it would undergo to confine those in 50 words they say for initially they say you write it in 500 words then you say here 300 words is required and i want to say i want to publish it for publishing it i want to have 50 words of your entire lifetime work and that is a massive word splitting so those who are working in that field you know they will realize that oh my god so much work has gone in they use the 50 word likhna kya hai but you will realize that writing small is far more difficult than writing big so somebody said you know that i did not have time so i wrote a big letter are aapke paas time nahi aapne bada letter kyu likha ha kyunki i i did not take any efforts i wrote a big letter fat 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 likh ke bhej diya so that's why writing small requires a huge efforts okay so what me think is always uh, always quite quite difficult so i'll stop here and uh, uh, let's see if there are some questions or uh, and give time for discussion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please go ahead if you have any questions uh, or. So, shall I stop sharing or you want me to keep sharing? I think so. You can stop sharing that. Okay. 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 Sharing. Are there any questions, Alokji? You can see on the Facebook. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just check uh, if there are any questions or comments or whatever. I think Professor Josi covered all the aspects. So, so there, there are okay. less chances of any questions. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem. Not a problem. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, since there are no questions and everything was so elaborate, I would like to formally propose a vote of thanks. Now, they say the mark of a brilliant teacher is that they come down to the level of the students and uh, go by their understanding and their level of comprehension. And today was that fortunate day for us to learn from much revered and knowledgeable and wonderful person, Professor Suhas Joshi, who started with such a uh, relaxing code that everyone's paper got rejected, even mine. You know, this mm -hmm. very sentence relaxed me so much. Oh God, now I have so much <laughs> to achieve. So because if, if my paper gets rejected, it's so motivating that if Professor Joshi says that even my paper mm -hmm. gets rejected, it's <laughs> fine. So that itself is so relaxing. And also by your talk, I could make out how the science and the oh, art so like, much. Like, uh, like an artist. And like a great communicator, you merge the science and technology. When you said that every paper, uh, can we uh, mute uh, yourself, Nirvan University, Alokji, I think? Yeah. Uh, when you said that it's, it's like establishing a dialogue with the world community. So this itself contains in itself so much of depth. And also that every paper has something to say. Every paper. So I, I just felt that I'm also listening to a literature person, also as well as a technology wizard, both the things. And uh, there were certain takeaways which really uh, made me think, like the way you talked about the abstract. The abstract is the most neglected part when I deal with the students and when we talk about it, because they say, okay, we'll do it. But that is the most important part, as you said, while doing the study and while writing the study as well. And the best, uh, the most important takeaway, which I felt was that preparing an Excel sheet of comparing the data of all the researches, novelty and everything. So all in all, uh, uh, right now I'm uttered speechless because I'm really still reflecting upon each and every sentence which you said, because each sentence in itself carries a lot of meaning in that. And also, we learned so much in this one hour. 
and so much to reflect upon. And we were talking about how to write a research paper, but then we also learned how to conduct a study also in that. It was a package deal. So I would like to thank you with the bottom of my heart, Professor Joshi. It was so nice of you, kind of you to accept our invitation and then deliver such a wonderful session, which was so useful and beneficial. So I thank you. Thanks a lot from the Nirvana University behalf and everyone and on my personal behalf. Thank you, sir. Thank you.